Okay, so um, our speaker today is Rusty Rozell, and Rusty's day job is um, water quality program manager with the Mecklenburg County um, Land Use and Environmental Services Agency, also known as LUISA. And Rusty does a great job with that and looking after the water quality in uh, Mecklenburg County. And you're going to hear another presentation from Rusty later on in the academy about his day job. But what we're going to, what Rusty's going to present about today is sort of his, his maybe his second passion, and that's history. And Rusty is, uh, has family ties to the Catawba region that go way back. And Rusty's a history buff, and he's done a lot of research and uh, has put together a great history of the Catawba. And a lot of it is told with a personal twist and some personal connections. Uh, and I think you'll find it really interesting. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rusty. Thank you, Barry. Am I coming in okay? It sounds fine to me. All right, good, thank you. And thank y'all, it's good, it's good to be here. And I wanna thank the Catawba Watery Water Management Group for asking me back. I love, I love doing this presentation and I love the, the group because uh, they're all about protecting the Catawba Watery uh, for us all to safely use. And as I think hopefully my presentation will illustrate that, that, that the importance of that cannot be overstated. We've got to protect this resource. It, it, it's to uh, protecting the resource sustains our community. We've got to do it. We don't have an option. So uh, what I want to do, this first slide you will see kind of shows a large scale view of the river, uh, I guess, schematic. You can see that it's the different jurisdictions that it runs through or by, including Marion, Morrison, Hickory, up the mountains. And then you see Lincoln Gap in Mecklenburg County around the river there that are shown. And then you can see where it flows uh, down into South Carolina. And the river begins up at the, in the Catawba Falls, which is, as you can see, it is west of Marion, it's near Old Fort, which is just east of Asheville, and it begins in a beautiful waterfall. And that waterfall uh, drop has a drop of about 50 feet, uh, very beautiful, and it's surrounding it are, are state park lands. So it, it is being preserved and protected, which is great because it always wasn't that way. And then you can see that it flows through 11 different man-made reservoirs that are indicated here in, in the shot or in the slide. And it, it stretches for 225 river miles. So it begins up here at the Catawba Falls, stretches all the way down here to where it ends at Lake Wateree. And there are a total of 1,800 miles of shoreline in the Catawba River. The 225 miles represent river channel miles. So that would be the, the middle of the river, the old river channel. And as I mentioned, there are this 11 reservoirs and in those reservoirs, there are 13 different dams. Most of those dams are in North Carolina and of all the, of all the rivers in North Carolina, the Catawba River is the one that is the most dammed river. Um, dammed from not, you know, the bad dam, dammed from meaning Dam for hydroelectric power generation. Uh, the, the basin area, so the surface area of these 11 lakes totals about almost 80,000 80, acres of full pond. Now that, that, that's a lot of land, uh, a lot of water surface. And the basin area is, is right at a little over 4,700 square miles. So you'll hear the word basin and watershed used interchangeably. So what that, all that refers to is the area of land that drains to the Catawba River. Uh, and again, that's right at a little bit over 4,700 square miles. The population in this basin or watershed is, is over 2 million people today. And it is, it is one of the fastest growing areas of the country. And we're about 10% of the watershed or the basin is urbanized, meaning cities, uh, you know, large urban developed areas and about 63% is forested. And most of that forested area 
is up in the headwaters, which is a good thing because that protects those headwaters from, from sources of pollution. So the Catawba River ends and down here uh, or flows past uh, Lansford, South Carolina, which like the headwaters is another very beautiful area of the river. There's many beautiful areas of the river, but this is a location of the uh, spider lily that blooms in April, May down there at Lansford Canal State Park in South Carolina, which is absolutely beautiful. It's one of the few areas in the, in the world where these lilies actually appear like this. It's, uh, it's quite a phenomenon. Maybe you can get down here this spring and see it. So in looking at all the different reservoirs, uh, you can see them here, starting with Lake James, uh, Lake, Hit Lake Roadhead, Hickory, Lookout, Shelves, Mormon, Mountain Mountain, Lake Wiley, Fishing Creek, Great Falls, Rocky Creek, and Lake Watery, beginning at an elevation of the lake begins the elevation of about 2,300, well over 2,300 feet. Uh, above sea level, and, it, and it, where it ends, it's about 147 square feet above sea level. And the drop is what makes the installation of the dam to the hydro station uh, uh, so attractive because that does generate a lot of that drop in elevation uh, enables us to generate or like able to, to generate a lot of those electricity. So, and what I'm going to do toward the end of the presentation is I'm going to take you for a little tour along all these 11 reservoirs and kind of talk a little bit about their history and what they're used for today. But I wanted to give you a sort of a large scale um, view of the watershed, which in this slide is outlined in red. This is the Catawba E watershed. This is the area that drains to the Catawba watery, which is a little over uh, 4,700 acres, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can see that the river mileage, 225 miles here. Uh, and now the Catawba Watery runs into the Cong Congaree River. And the Congaree stretches, the, the Watery River is about 75 miles. Uh, the, the, Catawba Water, the Catawba River stretches for about 225 miles. And then the Watery River flows into the Congaree River, and then the Congaree River uh, flows into the Santee. And the Santee stretches for about 143 miles before it flows into the Atlantic Ocean, kind of branches off portion of the Santee, goes in the Atlantic Ocean north of Charleston, and then a part of it goes to Lake Moultrie and Lake Marion and into Charleston Harbor. All told, from the beginning of the, from the Catawba Falls, it's an old fort down to Charleston Harbor. It's a total of 443 channel miles. So that's the course of the river. As you can see, uh, a lot of it, most of it is in South Carolina. A lot of it is in North Carolina. The, the headwater areas, of course, in North Carolina up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It flows uh, through the Piedmont and then down through the coastal plain. So it does span a lot of different geographies through the Carolinas. Can't talk about history unless you talk about how the Catawba River got its beginning. And they say that it was formed about the same time as the Appalachian Mountains, about 220 million years ago. And this would have been during the Mesozoic and the late Triassic period. So it, it literally formed as very rude way to say it, a drainage ditch for the for the Blue Ridge Mountains. So it formed to drain the waters off the mountain uh, where the lake, as you saw earlier slide, it originates. Now, as far as the historical inhabitants of the river, well, like of the, the watershed of the river basin, as you might expect, Native Americans were the first to, to settle here along the banks of the Catawba River. And really it all sort of began about 12,000 years ago, they tell us that the Paleo Indians uh, migrated across the Bering Strait into America uh, when they migrated from Northern Asia. And of course, during the ice age, uh, that land area, the, the ocean dried up there in the Bering Strait and that enabled the Native Americans, Paleo Indians to migrate from Northern Asia across that landmass 
into uh, what we now know as Alaska. And those Paleo Indians over time, about uh, after about 6,000 years, made their way south, uh, mainly fleeing the cold weather and the ice age. And they, uh, about 6,000 years ago, they think, uh, they settled along the banks of the Catawba River. And the Catawba River was a very attractive place to settle for the Native Americans because they have its abundant resources, a lot of fish, a very fertile bottom land along the river compared to the relatively poor soil in the clay and the rocky soil outside that those bottom lands. It, it really did prove to be a good area to live. Native Americans were the first to recognize that about 6,000 years ago. Early on, the Paleo Indians were very nomadic. As you can see, they hunted uh, 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 mammoths and large animals, and they would migrate and move about uh, following those herds. And later on, about a little while, about 6,000 years ago, that's really when they became much more sedentary and they began to live in villages and they began to hunt smaller game. Uh, and this is kind of happened after the end of the ice age. About about 1540, uh, the Spanish explorer De Soto, he marched some troops through the Piedmont. He was hunting for gold. And it is thought that he was probably the first one to make contact with the Native Americans. And the, you know, that back then the Native Americans were called themselves. Uh, people of the river in their language, they, they relied so heavily on the river that they literally called themselves in their native language, people of the river. And the, the people that the so encountered, they were part of the Suan speaking nation. And this is for Sioux, Sioux Indians that we know of out west, if this is a branch of that, of that tribe, of that nation that broke off and moved east. And they call themselves the Catawba people of the river. And actually the word that they have in their, in their language is much longer and much more complicated, but I'll not try to say it because I will definitely butcher it with my Southern accent. But it was shortened to Catawba by some of DeSoto's men uh, who sort of uh, abbreviated it so it'd be easy to say. And that happened, of course, when they came through here in the 1500s. And the, the Soto's men and the settlers that followed the Soto as he came to this area of the Piedmont became, got to know the Native American Indians, um, the Catawba Indians, and traded a lot with them. And well, for the most part, the, the Catawbas were fairly friendly to the Spanish, but in later years, they did war with the Spanish and became sort of allied with the English. Uh, but initially on, it was a very very good relationship between the Europeans and the Spanish that came through this area and the Native Americans. And by 1600, um, the population of the Catawba Nation had reached its peak of about 15 to 25,000 uh, folks. And it was really more of a uh, uh, collection of tribes that lived along the Catawba River more than anything else. So they lived in these villages as shown in the bottom. They they relied a lot on fish out of the river for their sustenance. They grew corn and squash in the rich fertile bottom lands of the Catawba. They ate, uh, they also hunted pigeons. And if you're not familiar with pigeon uh, history of this area, pigeons were so numerous in the 15, 1600s, really up to the 17 and 1800s, that they would literally block the sun when they flew. And the Native Americans would hunt these pigeons with blowguns and, and actually relied on them uh, for food quite heavily. And the Catawba Indians, this, this configuration of tribes along the Catawba River we call the Catawba Nation, they were at war almost constantly with the Cherokee Nation, which they joined borders with on the west. And they were also quite often warring with the Air Force. And the Catawba Indians were known to be fierce fighters. You know, Native Americans were, the more enemies you had, the more powerful you were. They had a lot of enemies. And they, as you can see, had this thick wall or thick fortress, yeah, with barrier around their village hut, which were made out of bark and sticks. 
and they would have a, a meeting hall always kind of central to that area and they would have a, a, a meeting area with a fire, a large fire in the middle of this of this fortress, so to speak. So it was kind of an interesting it's and it, it I grew up watching Western, please forgive me uh, uh, but if you um, learn more about the Indians of the East, they were had a lot were a lot different than the Indians of the West and their how they lived, what they ate, and how they sustained themselves. So, as I mentioned, the, the combination was more of a group of tribes, and this kind of illustrates some of those tribes. And we recognize some of those tribes based off of the names of some of the, the areas that uh, we know of today. For example, we have the, the Waxhaw Indians, uh, we have the Congaree Indians, the Santu, uh, and the Winya, and the Siri, uh down here near the coast. And you can see surrounding the, the Catawbas, uh, the Catawba Nation here on the Catawba River, we have the Cherokee, the Creek, uh, the Tuscarora, uh, and the Watery, of course, is named after there was a, a tribe of Indians there, a, a branch of the Catawba referred to as the Watery. And, you know, these, these Native Americans had some very interesting dressing and, and some very interesting habits. For example, they would uh, tie, the, the mothers uh, would tie, um, in some of these villages, would tie stones, flat stones around their baby's head to spread their eyes out wide and to make a flat top on the top of their head because it was thought that they made the males, it was thought that it made them more fierce looking. And I have to agree, that'd be pretty fierce looking if I was in battle. So, and, and the other thing, they had all kind of little, they, they relied a lot on sweet gums uh, for their medicinal purpose. You know, the gut, sweet gum tree has those prickly balls that my grandpa hated. Well, they loved them, but, and they used a lot of the sweet gums that we meet a lot of needs. So all kind of folklore behind the Native Americans in this area. You can see some of their uh, attire. This is their warlike attire and some of their headdresses. And these are more of their... Uh, Attire that they would wear during the celebration. And uh, then we've got this is a closer picture of their uh, meeting hall that is formed out of bark. Uh, and then sort of a view of, of the typical Catawba uh, Indian during uh, taken during the 1800s. So quite an amazing people, uh, quite an amazing history. And of course, a people that has been decimated a lot of the decimated meaning the population has been greatly diminished over the years, and we've gone from 25,000 in the 1700s to 1738. Smallpox decimated the population uh, to about 5,000, and then uh, by 1780, uh, that's what their population set at, is, and in today, it numbers a couple of thousand uh, uh, folks. So a population once great has been greatly diminished by their interactions with the Europeans and their diseases. Unfortunately. So in 16, by 1660, uh, King Charles of England had established the Carolinas. They weren't called North and South Carolina. They were called the Carolinas, uh, and it was province of England over here in the Americas. And he put the rule of this area under eight lords. And these eight lords pretty much governed this area. And by 1700, the area had, had so numerous colonial settlements, English settlements up in the Catawba River Valley, and most of the inhabitants in the area were Scots Irish. Uh, by 1760 is really when the diseases had pretty much diminished the Native American population. And today in the Catawba River, we have, of course, a population of over 2 million people in our watershed, Native Americans numbering among us about 3,300. Can't talk about the Catawba River without talking about a feller named John Lawson. John Lawson, he was a, an English naturalist, and he was uh, 26 years old, hard for me to believe, 26 years old, when on December the 28th, 1700, he embarked on a journey up the Catawba River, beginning in Charleston Harbor. He paddled 
with a group and a couple of canoes, including some Native American guys, through the Catawba River, up the Catawba River. He, he left the Catawba River Channel before he got up too far up into the Blue Ridge, and he migrated eastward across the, uh, the Carolinas towards the coast. The red line kind of shows his travels. Uh, and he, his, he kept a journal. He was a bell, very well, uh, a man that could write very well, very well spoken individual, well educated, well, well known, well liked, well regarded. And these eight Lord proprietors take, took very careful notes of his journal entries and all the many fascinating things about this area. And they became bent and determined to, to get this area, the Catawba River Valley, settled by, by English folks, folks so that obviously the more people that lived here, the, the more prosperous those eight world proprietors would become. And so the journal was published. A lot of people read it. They really relied on what a lot of said, a lot of it was believed and, and counted on. Him. And John Austin also founded two towns here in the Carolinas, Bath and Newburn. And John Lawson died in 1711 at a very young age. He was actually killed by the Tuscarora people. Uh, although he had befriended the Catawba nation, uh, the Tuscarora were at war with the Catawba. He didn't fare well when he went through their area and they took his life. So, Great things in the journal. And actually, if you Google John Lawson, you can pull up his diary. And the, these are some of the animals that he, he drew. He actually drew these pictures this is out of his diary. And one of the things that, that he said, which fascinated me. So my experience with Lawson is what I see on the highway growing up. You know, they, they kind of were gave up their lives to the modern highway a lot of times though and i kind of saw them a lot you know john lawson never saw a possum he, they didn't have them in england and in europe and he noted them as the, the wonder of all land animals which improved you uh, but if you think about it it's a wondrous animal but the buffalo that he encountered he said that it it grunts like a hog obviously he wasn't doing the best press with the buffalo if any of us were to see a buffalo in the Catawba Basin today, we'd probably have a heart attack. I know I would, but to him, it was just an everyday occurrence. So he was very fascinated with the Native Americans he encountered, uh, talking about how they believe that if you put a lot of bear grease on your hair, it keeps your hair from falling out, and all kind of other little wise tales and different things they had. So if you get a chance, go look up John Lawson on the, on the internet. Uh, it's, it's a great read. And another thing that John Lawson noted in his diary is that it was abounding in many and delights and rivulets. So, you know, these Lord proprietors noted that with uh, great interest, and they began to encourage millers, people that build and operate water mills, to come to the Carolinas to build these mills, gave them tax exemptions, freedom from military service, special protection. And by 1800, these water mills, and this is a picture of the Whitley Mill on Lake Norman, the last operating water mill in Mecklenburg County. It operated almost 30 years from 1820 to 1990. See all the, the big workings and gears. This is the, the mill wheel that is turned by water. All the gears are down here in the lower part of the mill house. Uh, and there are mill stones in there that grind grain uh, in the flour. And then the upper part of the mill is where they would store a lot of that grain. And also, the upper part of the mill is where folks would hold town meetings. So the mill house and the mill kind of came the focal point of many communities in the Catawba River Basin, and uh, it kind of led to a lot of the growth and development of these communities. So you can see early on the, the Catawba River and its tributaries played a huge role in the development and the settlement of our area. And millers became community leaders and uh, advocates for, for growth and development of the community. Probably one of the first commercial uh, adventures along the Catawba River was fishery. And it's kind of hard for us to believe, but the Catawba River in the early days and even today had a lot of fish in it. And so what would happen even with the Native Americans is they would build these fish traps. Yes, this is a fish trap. So what it is, these stones uh, are, are backed up and sort of a, creating a funnel. The fish come in here upstream, 
come into the funnel from upstream through this larger opening and get trapped down here into these smaller areas. The Native Americans and even Europeans and, and my ancestors had a fish trap along the Catawba River back in the day. They, they would go in, harvest these fish, sell them and trade them. So it became a very, very early commercial enterprise there on the Catawba River. Another commercial use along the river was agriculture. Agriculture was king in the 17 and 1800s. That's what most of the land was used for. It was mainly used for growing cotton and corn. Those were the two big crops, particularly in the Piedmont of the Carolinas. Again, you had these large, broad, flat floodplains that sort of slice through the red, uh, rocky clay of the Piedmont and the mountains that made excellent areas for growing crops. And a lot of crops were grown, a lot of cotton was grown, a lot of corn was grown. Um, and my great aunt, who you'll you'll meet here in just a minute, uh, she would often say that my family grew a lot of corn. I always had big crops of corn. And, and she said that she suspected they used it to make foreign liquor and made a lot of money off of it. So, you know, there's that too. So one of the things about this area of the country, if you haven't noticed, you talk about the red clay. You know, it's back in the 17 and 1800s when your crops came to harvest, it's kind of hard to get them to, to the sale because the roads are terrible. And that red clay gets really slick. And there's always lots of potholes and big old wagons don't fare too well on it. So early on, there was an interest, and there's always been an interest by the Europeans to try to navigate the Catawba River. Big boats don't have never been able to navigate up and down the Catawba River, too shallow, too many rocks. But in the 1820s, from 1820 to 1835, flat boats were fairly often used on the Catawba, and they were used to tram transport goods, transport goods down to the Charleston Harbor. Typically, you can see the flat boat example there on the left. They were about 60 feet long and seven feet wide. And they, it was enough to carry about 50 bales of cotton. And it was usually pulled down the Catawba River. The one challenge was the falls there at Lansford, South Carolina, south of Charlotte, down, down there where those spider lilies are. That's sort of the a falls of the river. That's where the, the, the you know, the coastal plain, uh, the Piedmont leaves uh, and enters into the coastal plain. We've got a drop there in the river and a lot of rock, so can't get a flat boat through there. So in 1823, they did uh, perform an in great engineering feat and built a canal. And you can see the remnants of that canal, Lancet Canal in Chester, South Carolina, which is a historic site today. And it looks like this today. This is, is quite amazing. Uh, the canal is two miles long, 12 feet wide, 10 feet deep. It's got five locks on it that enable folks using the, the, the canal to drop 32 feet uh, in distance down the river in elevation down the river uh, without having to traverse through those rocks. So what would happen is you would pull into this canal and you would hook up your flat boat to a team of mules and the mules would pull you through the canal as the different locks were activated until you dropped that 32 feet safely past that rocky shoal. In 1846, the canal went out of use. And the reason is, in 1846, the railroad showed up. So there was no longer a need to have to use wagons on muddy roads. And the railroad was a lot more efficient than the flat boat. So the railroad, railroad became king about that time and became the major source of transportation. As you mentioned or, earlier, this is currently the Lansford Canal State Park down near the Chester and Lake and uh, South Carolina. So although the river in the early days provided a potential source of transportation uh, with the flatboat, it impeded transportation if you wanted to go east to west or west to east. You had to cross the river. If you were coming from Gaston Lincoln or any of the counties over in the west coming east, and you had to cross it. This is Mecklenburg County. This is one of the earlier maps of Mecklenburg County. This is a map from 1911 it's called the, the Spratt map. It was developed by Spratt Engineering, and it shows the 11, 13 ferries and two Fords along the western, western uh, 
shoreline here in Mecklenburg County uh, that were used to cross the river. And it's, I can't overstate the importance of these ferries and these boards. Reason being, there were no bridges in 1800s. 1700s and 1800s, there were no bridges on the Catawba River. So if you wanted to cross, which a lot of people did, you had to know these ferries and know these boards, and you had to have some coin in your pocket to pay the toll to get across the river. So you have Tuckasegee Ford. This is where the Whitewater Park is today. And then you had the Beatty Ford up in the upper part of the picture and slide there. And then you had the Roselle Ferry. And this was a ferry that was owned and operated by my family from 1790. And the last operation of the ferry was through 1923. And the original ferry, this is a picture of my great grandfather operating the ferry. This would have been taken about 1917, 1918. And you can see later use of the ferry, they pulled it across the river using a cable. And the early use of the ferry, they would pull it across the river. And they, they did charge a toll. Here you go. So if you wanted to use it, you had a, a horse, a loose horse or a mule, it was five cents. So a man on foot was 25 cents and a two horse wagon 50 cents. And I, I've never been able to understand this thing that every animal on foot for exhibition was 25 cents. Maybe they had a lot of animal exhibitions back in the day. But I got, I got this information from my great aunt who has kept up with it all the years. Um, I applied inflation. And that's what it costs you today. That's not too bad. Uh, of course, the ferry uh, obviously discontinued operation. It would operate to build a bridge. Uh, the bridge would watch out and be destroyed and open back up. And it last operated in 1923. And the road that was used to come from the ferry through Mecklenburg County into the city of Charlotte was called Roswell's Ferry Road or, or Roswell's Ferry Road. And it's still called that today. It, it basically follows what we know now as Brookshire Boulevard. Several of the old paths of the road still bear the name Roswell's Ferry. One of the first bridges built across the Catawba, it was in 1855 by the Western Plank Road Company, which is offices here in Charlotte, and they entered into agreement with, with my great, great, great grandfather. He agreed to close the, the ferry so that he wouldn't be competing with the bridge and then the Western Plank Road Company allowed him to use the bridge free. So it's kind of hard for us to understand. But back in the 17 and 1800s, we didn't know how to use steel as they did. So everything was built out of wood. And a wooden bridge doesn't do very good. So you can imagine the rock is easily washed away in high water. Uh, the use of concrete for building the pillars is not completely understood. Also, we didn't have an NCDOT. So all the bridges and all the ferries and all the transportation was built by the private sector. Well, the private sector, to get their money back, they charged the toll. So there wasn't much interest in building bridges until the middle 1800s. Uh, and even then, it was problematic. But this was the first one um, that was built crossing from the West Bank over into Mecklenburg County. And it was called the Roselle Ferry Bridge uh, back in 1855. And then in 1865, during the Civil War, General Stoneman's cavalry, which he was detached from General Sherman's army, uh, they were moving north and they were given orders to disrupt transportation routes, routes up in the Carolinas. And uh, there was a general by the name of Robert Johnson. He lived over there in Lincolnton. Uh, word got to him that a detachment of that cavalry was coming to Charlotte from Lincoln. So he gathered a small detachment of troops and set up a defensive position in Mecklenburg County right there to Roselle Ferry. And there was a fairly hot battle that ensued when the Union troops showed up. Uh, the general took a bullet to the chest that happened to hit a, his, his change purse and been a penny that saved his life. And the Federals couldn't cross the bridge. So they set fire to it and the ferry had to reopen. And it remained in operation uh, from, ninth, from that time, 1865, for, 40, for 45 years when there was no bridge there crossing from 
the west into Mecklenburg County, and the ferry was, and the fords were the sole means of crossing. And, you know, you can go back and, and read some old historic, uh, old newspaper articles about those times. That was quite an economic hardship for the area. So the river, the river was, was a lot different than it is today. It was a friend and a foe at the same time. It separated you from your neighbors in a serious way. It, a lot of people went to school on the other side of the river, went to church, had family members over there. The bridge was gone, it got really hard to get across. And so that was a real, real problem. And it was celebrated greatly when this new bridge was built. And you see, it's got steel in it. This was in 1910, much better bridge and a much, much more substantial, but not even that bridge could stand up to what happened in 1916, July, when two hurricanes collided over the Blue Ridge Mountains and deposited 24 inches of rain in a, in a, a 48 hour period and caused tremendous flooding. The river rose 40 left, 40 feet above its normal elevation. 40 people lost their lives and all the bridges were destroyed. This is the worst natural disaster in the history of, of this area was the Piedmont of the Carolinas. And it was I felt quite a blow to the residents. So I met with my great aunt, Ella Hart, uh, back in 1986. And she told us the story about the river. And I want to tell you. Yeah, I don't forget. Uh, we saw a uh, rock and chairs and things going down in the And uh, went home, fed. And your daddy, Ella, they large, great daddy, and made it see the bridge go down. He saw the bridge go down. And I was in bed from the weather. And your dad came by and he, he said, Ella, I said, what? Well, the bridge is gone. It just felt like somebody had died. Mm -hmm. Same time. Mm -hmm. So I had to go down a woman sitting on the porch coaching. Now I don't know what the woman sitting on the porch said. You know, she was a very humble uh and unlike me, she was not prone to exaggeration. So uh I can't help but believe she saw something. Another another very interesting fact that is lost to us today is, is that after the Civil War, the, the, the Cabo River Valley grew tremendously as a result of the development of the textile industry. So this is kind of what happened. I mentioned earlier we grew a lot of cotton in the watershed basin, the Cabo River Basin. Well, there after the Civil War became an interest to take the power of the river to run factories, the hydropower I'm referring to, to through turn the water water wheels, elaborate water wheels, and industry began to bring up. Industry that took that raw cotton and turned it into yarn and turned it into cloth. And it was a quite lucrative industry. You can see here. This is the Mountain Island Water Mill, which is the first mill in Gaston County that opened in 1916. It was washed out by that uh, Cabo River flood in 1916. And so these mills built up, and a lot of the farmers back after the Civil War were extremely poor, and they were looking for a better source of income. So they would go to these mills to work, and the mill owners began to build houses around the mill for these folks to live in. So they would move lock, stock, and barrel and move in these homes owned by the mill, earn a very good living and really prosper by these mills. And the community prospered by these mills. And you know, by the 20th century, more than half the working population in the Catawba River Valley relied on the textile industry for their employment. Incredible uh, people leaving their homes and coming to live in an entirely different way of life where they were greatly benefited by it. It was a huge industry. And if you're not from this area, you don't understand it. That's all I can say. But the mill, the mill villages, the term, and, and all the things that the mill saw are, are huge and important. And keep in mind, they're all gone. They're all gone. They're not here anymore. They, that industry has gone elsewhere where it's done cheaper. Uh, but for the most part, we don't see the, the cotton mills. But up until the 70s and the 80s, it employed a tremendous number of people. My grandfather, uh, he worked in a cotton mill and, and he said that, you know, the work was hard and long. They worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. Uh, 
<clears throat> Another comment he said is, in the Mill Village, we were all poor, but we were never hungry, and we didn't know we were poor because everybody was poor. And that was kind of the way he summed it up. So I want to talk a little bit about the lake now. So we're going to leave the river, talk about how the lake was formed. And, and sort of the history of that is, fair, is fairly interesting. The 1916 flood kind of opened the door to the building of the dam. Because imagine prior to you know the 20th century, the river flowed free. <clears throat> Beginning in the early 20th century, the dams began to control the river. That's a huge change. And 1916 flood opened the door for that change. Although Duke, Duke Energy will quickly tell you the dams are not there to control flooding, they do help uh, quite a bit. And people knew that back after the 1916 flood. So they were a little more agreeable to selling their land to uh, create the, the lake and build the dam, build the dams and create the lake. And it really all started uh, really in 1895. The first Hydro station built was a, there at Niagara Falls. And this is a picture of it. And I got to tell you, this is about the ugliest looking thing I've ever seen. But see all the water that's coming out? I don't feel, I don't understand all this stuff. But you got to understand the way a, a dam works. The water is obviously on the high side of the dam, the higher and low side of the dam. And there is a, a wheel or a turbine inside that structure, that concrete structure of the dam. The water runs past that turbine, the turbine. Uh, spins a generator and generator produces electricity and the water comes out on the low side of the dam. Now that's my non-engineer, very simplistic uh, view of the way the thing works, but that is really how it works. And the first one built was in 1895. The cotton industry and the cotton mills were the first ones to use this hydropower. And the, then the cotton mills began to provide power to the mill villages and that began to grow and expand. And then Duke Energy, Duke Power, Southern Power showed up in the early 20th century and began to expand the use of the dams and what we have today. That's what it is developed into. And it all started a gentleman called William State Lee. And he helped build this dam at Niagara Falls. And he said, I, I think it's uh, to himself maybe, why can't we do this back home on the Catawba River? William State Lee was from South Carolina. And but he went up to New York and, and the Niagara Falls to work on this dam. And he thought, well, you know, I'm gonna go down there as he's an engineer and I'm gonna see if we can build these things down there on the Catawba. And he partnered with a fellow by the name of Dr. Walker Gill Wiley. Now, Dr. Wiley was actually from New York, he'd moved down to this area and he was a physician with a vision. And Dr. Wiley and Mr. Lee went to visit a fellow by the name of James Buchanan or Buck Duke who was a very wealthy man. He was a, a North Carolina tobacco and a textile giant. He owned and operated a lot of his meals. He's also the benefactor of Duke University. And they made the pitch to him about turning the Catawba into a, into a giant producer of electricity. And he believed in it. He gave them $50,000. And from those $50,000, they launched the Southern Power Company, which later you see, you became the Rusty. Yes. Rusty, sorry to interrupt, but do you need to advance your slide? Yes. Later became okay. Duke Power and uh, later became Duke Energy. And Duke Power went on to develop the Chicago River as, as a source of electricity that we know today. And grandson or Bill Lee, uh, his grandson, Bill Lee, or William State Lee the third, was the chief engineer at Lake Norman, later CEO and of Duke Power. So that's kind of the history of how the dams got started. And the first uh, lake in the system uh, we know is Lake James. And this is a picture of it. It's up there in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's uh, near Marion. It, it is created by the confluence of the Limbo River and the Catawba. And the dam is referred, it's referred to as Bridgewater because of the town that's nearby. It includes three dams, Catawba, Patty Creek, and Limbo Dam. It was completed in 1919. Uh, it was the seventh of the dams, of the 11 dams to be completed in the chain. Uh, and it, there are five other dams that were completed after it in the 1920s. And it's named for the, the founder of New Power, uh, James Buchanan or Buck Duke. Uh, and its surface area is about 7,000 acres, fourth largest lake in the system, and the deepest lake, and it has the longest retention time. And it also has uh, the water supply on it for the, for the city of Mary. 
moved down river. The second lake in the chain is, is Lake Rodius, and it is formed by what's called Rodius Dam. It was completed in 1925. It was the ninth dam in lake to be formed on the chain. And it's named for the Rodius name comes from John M. Rodius from Gaston County and George B. Rodius, uh, I mean, from John M. Rhodes and George B. Hiss, uh, who joined together to form a company, a cotton mill on the upper Catawba and built a highway station to power that mill. Duke Energy purchased the mill in 1924, expanded the dam and have operated it ever since. And that's why we call it Rhodes, Mr. Hiss and Mr. Uh, Rhodes. Surface area is one of the law, smaller lakes there are only three lakes smaller. It covers about 2,700 acres. It's the water supply for Morganton and uh, is, is located on the town of Morganton and its water supply are located in the portions of, portions of free flowing lake, portions of the river on Lake James and Lake Rodeo. Moving down the river, the next lake we encounter, this is Lake Hickory. And Lake Hickory is named for the town nearby, of course, which is Hickory. It was formed in 1928. It was the 10th lake to be completed. Uh, it's a fairly large lake. And Oxford Dam, and was in the, the form of the lake, was named after Sam Oxford, who was a landowner and operator of the ferry where the dam is located today. And it's the fifth largest lake in the surface area of about 4,000 acres, and it provides a water supply. It move on downstream, you, you run into Lookout Shoals, you're just upstream of Lake Norman. Uh, it was it's formed by Lookout Shoals Dam. It's, it's kind of named for the run of the river just upstream of that dam, which creates a shoal or a rocky area. It's the smallest Catawba River lake in North Carolina, <laughs> a little over 1,100 acres, water supply for states. And then we come to the next lake in the chain, which is Lake Norman. And this is the largest lake in the chain. It's formed by Cowan Ford Dam. And the lake was completed in 1963, and it is, it is the 11th and the last lake created or, or dam that was built. And it's named for a former president of Duke Power. It's the largest lake in the system, it's over 32,000 acres. Water supply to Lincoln County, Morrisville, and Charlotte, Mecklenburg has the second longest extension time, holds water back by 224 days, second only to Lake James. And of course, it's the largest conventional hydro station that that you can use on. Home. And we get moved downstream, and we get to uh, this. This is actually a picture of the construction of Town Ford Dam. And below Town Ford Dam, downstream we have Mount Nile Lake. And Mount Nile Lake again is one of the smaller lakes in the system. It was finished in 1924, the eighth uh, lake in the chain to be created. This name for the Mount Nile, and you see there in the center of the picture, it has the largest permitted withdrawal uh, for drinking water of all the 11 lakes in the Catawba River Basin. And its retention time is actually quite low, 11 days, which makes it a, a particularly good water supply in that Lake Norman has a long retention time. A lot of these pollutants, including sediment, settle out in Norman during that long retention time. Mount Nile has a low retention time, a lot of flow through. So the water is really of good quality. And uh, you, you can see it in the in the water that it provides to the different communities, including Mount Holly, Gastonia, and Charlotte, and Mecklenburg, uh, 100 and almost 117 million gallons of water a day. Brings us to Lake Wiley. Now, this Lake Wiley runs from North Carolina and South Carolina. And this is the first dam. It was the first dam, and it was named, created. Of Lake Wiley. It was named for Walker, Dr. Walker Gill Wiley. I talked about him earlier. And Dr. Wiley actually partnered with his brother and Mr. Duke in the enterprise to create this lake. Uh, it was much smaller when first created. You power bought it in the 19, in 1910 and expanded the dam. It was built first in 1904. You power expanded in 1910. And the dam washed out during the 1916 flood and had to be rebuilt by Duke Energy. It covers, it's the third largest lake, covers a little over 12,000 acres. It's one, it's the area, it's the lake that was first developed, as far as I know, very 
dense, high density development along the Catawba River first occurred. Uh, really, at this bridge, this is Buster Ford Bridge across the North Carolina and South Carolina. You can see the development there along that lake. It's a very wide, this is where the lake is the widest and deepest. And this is where the Catawba River first experienced this more higher density development. And this is a look at the hydro station that was built by Dr. Wiley and his brother in 1904 that washed out in 1612. So we move a little further downstream, which brings us to the Next, the eighth lake in the 11 lake chain is formed by Fishing Creek Dam. It was completed in 1916. Fifth, the fifth dam to be completed in the chain is the water supply, the water supply for Chester. It's also a water supply for a paper mill down here in South Carolina. It, it's only slightly smaller than Mountain Island, uh, covers about 3,400 acres. Come to the Ninth Lake. This is the Great Falls. It's near the town of Great Falls in South Carolina. It's where it gets its name. And it is one of the older dams. It was the second dam built in 1907. And it, it covers the lake, covers about 353 acres. And there are no municipal water supplies in it. Coming toward the end here, number 10, Cedar Creek, formed by Cedar Creek Dam. And it was finished in 1909. There's a third third dam completed in this county, second smallest. And this is a favorite favorite lake for uh, canoeing and fishing because it's small, uh, it's got a lot of good structure, rocky, and a lot of good fish habitat. And there are no municipal water in the Last lake is Lake Watery, formed by Watery Dam. It was the sixth dam in lake to be completed in 1919, named actually for the Watery Indian, uh, the second largest lake of 13,000 acres. And last lake in the Catawba, of course, flows into the water a year. And the city of Lugolf and Camden used this lake as a reservoir. When you add all the water usage up, you know, it's several, it's a couple hundred million gallons every day. Enough water to fill pants the stadium two and a half times. A lot of water. The lakes are all also very heavy used for recreation. Uh, you can you estimate 6 million, 16 million people visit the Catawba River annually, and that's estimated to increase by 10% between now and 2050. Hydro stations, uh, they're, they're one of the first and, and continu continuing uses of the Catawba River provide enough electricity to supply about 103,000 homes. And the lakes that were created as a result of these hydro stations uh, have provide cooling water for the steam station and for the nuclear plant, which provide even more folks with electricity. So this river powers our money. This river provides drinking water for a lot of homes. This river is extremely important. It, you can't overstate it. Before. And, and basically, the, the, the Catawba River I think you can see through my presentation, it shapes our past, it sustains us in the present, and it's going to dictate our future. And all the communities along its, along its shores, we've got to understand that, and we've got to commit ourselves wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly to its protection if we're going to continue to be able to use it. So, you know, I kind of like think of it sometimes, as this, is, this is a strange analogy, but uh, <clears throat> it's it's one that I think applies. So the Catawba River is like a mule hooked up to a plow. It has been since the Native Americans showed up. It's a workhorse. You know, that mule pull that plow all day long in nice steady slow pace. And it, and it will plow the field that we need to grow the crops to sustain it. Now, back after we built Lake Norman, uh, there was a big change that occurred in that river. Prior to Lake Norman, not many people lived on the river. It was not an attractive place to live. It was actually considered an un, unattractive place to live. Lake Norman was so huge, it had those beautiful vistas, those pretty sunsets, those navigable waters, those deep waters, a very clean water. A lot of people began to move along, live along its banks. The price of land sold. And that same concept spread to the other lakes in the river. And the river began to expand and grow. And all of a sudden now we've got a fine racing horse hooked up to that mule pulling that plow. But 
me is my granddaddy, he did a lot of plowing with horses and mules. They always told me, don't put a racing horse with a mule because when you're plowing, because that mule, he'll want to go slow when that race horse wants to, or that horse wants to go fast, and that mule will want to pull when that race horse gets tired. So the story is behind all that is when you take care of those, when your animals and you plow them, be sure you feed that mule first uh, because that's what's going to feed you at the end of the road. We've got to take care of the Catawba River for its use. We also got to take care of it uh, for its recreational use and its economic use to our community. But at the end of the day, there are certain things we just got to do to keep that water properly dammed and properly used. And it's a conflict a lot of times. People on the river are told their water level is going to drop a foot because we have to maintain a dam. Or we're told that we have to restrict our use of water and not use it for irrigation during a drought. But all those are essential things for the use of the river. We just got to learn a little bit because the bottom line is we've got to keep that river in good shape. And that's kind of it, Barry. I went over four minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs>